Wait for YouTube to catch up. Come on, YouTube. Do it. Good evening. Good evening. Start like a hair early, like 10 seconds before 6 o'clock. Uh, so, we'll let folks get in here and I'll get on topic, but... Um, uh, the Greater Seattle Aquarium Society is starting their meeting at the same time as my stream this week, which kind of sucks. Uh, but why that matters, and I will totally not feel bad if you go over there, is this. They have the founder of Imperial Tropicals, which is one of the, I would say, better uh, Florida fish farms that's out there, who's going to be doing a talk for my club. So that's pretty awesome. Uh, I won't be I won't be mad if you go watch that instead, but <laughs> uh, I'll be watching it on the replay, unfortunately, <laughs> because I'm going to stream. It's my normal stream time. Uh, I actually just got a, a message from Master Breeder Dean who's like, hey, are you, is your stream the same time as the club meeting? I was like, yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> but such is life. Uh, for his schedule, they needed to bring it back an hour because usually our meetings start about seven when it comes to the streaming meetings that we're doing because of human malware. So there's that. Uh, let's, let's talk a couple cool things and I'll get on topic. Uh, number one, for those that watch my Instagram, I put up a picture of some eggs from my Leopoldi angel. It's like the first time I've seen them spawn. So that's kind of exciting. I, I was actually kind of convinced cause I can't, I'm really bad at sexing angelfish, uh, especially with the, the Leopoldi are a little more uniform male to female. It's a little harder to sex them without the breeding tube being down. Uh, even Master Breeder Dean, who has been over here before, was like, I, I can't be certain, right? <laughs> He's like, I think you have a female in there, but I can't be certain because they're a little different than like your typical Scolari style angels. Uh, and part of that comes with their, their nose shape changes, some of their body shape and some of the ways that you would normally tell in most of the Scolari angels. But I do have a female. I was worried for a while I had all boys because I've had them for two years now. Yeah, about two years. And they're, you know, they're, they were good size when I got them. They, they've definitely gotten a little bit bigger. They've got to their full adult size. And uh, yeah, I hadn't seen any spawning, right? So um, it's kind of sitting there thinking, like, maybe I got males or, or just like they're not happy enough. And they were in, uh, like, fully planted tank, and the tank is not in as great shape as it used to be, and part of that's just because I haven't maintained it as well, I've been working so much, and now is when they wanted to spawn. <laughs> so, like, the next couple of days, you'll see a couple short videos I caught while I actually watched them laying their eggs and, and the male fertilizing them, which was really exciting for me, because I was sitting there doing some stuff with um, some other fish that are in my fish room, <laughs> that uh, are pretty new. And uh, I, I just kind of glanced over and I, I noticed like one fish like this on the side of the glass doing a slow sim shimmy upward. And I'm like, I know what that normally means. Is that what's going on? And I just kind of like kept watching and that fish becks away and the other one comes up and does the same shimmy up in a line. I'm like, oh, <gasps> I guess, like, I haven't had angelfish breed in front of me since I was a kid. Um, you know, I've, I've watched other, I've watched uh, videos of friends I know when they, they have their angelfish breed and stuff, but I haven't actually, like, seen them laying eggs and spawning since I was a kid when we had some just kind of accidentally breed in, a, in my community tank when I was a kid. So that was, that was, like, my cool moment while working on some other ones, but yeah, <laughs> I, uh, I will say like, I like the fact that it's the Leopold eyes because they're just a cool angel. You know, they're, they're a little different than most of your normal Scalaris and all your color variants that the color variants are super cool, but it's really nice. Um, having a like more wild angel to me, it's just kind of a, that way to get in touch with the, the, the natural wonder as opposed to the line bread, but I got my guppies, so I really can't talk there, right? <laughs> anyway, the this this topic's going to be kind of interesting, and it, it we'll take it from like a let's go like philosophical bent, right? And this might be 
this might be interesting. So here's how this is going to work. I'm going to talk about like how I approach like mastering the aquarium, right? And uh, the, this might be weird. So let me let me give you the preface for this. This will make sense. Oh man, am I missing something in here? What's what's going on? Chat you're going crazy. Which Steven? Hold on. Where did I miss? Oh my god, hit by a drunk driver. Jeez, John. Um hey John, just if there's a um if there's any kind of information or something out there, uh, like a, a GoFundMe, anything like that, feel free to link it. It'll kind of get auto-blocked, but I think Candy will be able to forward it. Um, but yeah, that's that's terrible. That's absolutely terrible. You never want... This is like one of the reasons why um, I'm very thankful that members of my family who have had big alcohol issues in the past have... Uh, gotten past that and have gone into recovery which you know it's a it's a never-ending process if you know anybody who's gone through uh becoming a recovering alcoholic it's a really long process it's just it's not about what you do to yourself it's about what you can do to other people it's absolutely terrifying and things like this are exactly that so anyway um i'm not trying to like downplay that but i want to even like a peppy thing in my head and I kind of want to get it out. So here's the jam. I was, uh, talking to, we'll, we'll go with a friend, a mentor. And I had, I had a couple questions for an upcoming project. And I'm not going to spoil those questions. So I don't want to spoil that project, but I had a, like two simple questions in my mind. They were basically opinion questions that I sent to, uh, man, myth, legend, my personal fish hero, Gary Lang, Right. It, John, don't worry about the sidestep. I totally understand. Like I said, if there's a GoFundMe or anything, feel free to link it. Candy, feel free to push that through in chat if it gets blocked. Um, so with that being said, Gary responded to me because I, I sent like a small novel to him because I wanted to have, give him as much information as possible before the two questions, which were opinion questions, right? I'm, I've played this game long enough that I want to give people as much information as possible. And Gary, Gary sends me a very short reply, which was basically, hey, this is too much to type out on a phone because I have a bunch of questions for you first. So just call me tomorrow when he, and he, he replied late at night. So needless to say yesterday, I was on the phone with him for 45 minutes. And, uh, and yeah, yeah, I have Gary's phone number. I'm, I'm, I'm at that level of, of rainbow fish nerd and that like. I have his phone number and we talk every once in a while. Not very often. It's pretty rare, but I think once a year, once a year we'll chat. <laughs> maybe, maybe once every six months. And so I asked him two questions, right? He, he started, started with about 10 of information he wanted in order to then talk about those two questions. So first tip, right? If you have a mentor, if you have a, an experienced member of a club, even if it's like someone on YouTube that you trust, don't be afraid to ask questions. No matter how much we know, there's always someone who knows way more than us. Uh, I've had a similarly long set of conversations, actually far longer, with Master Breeder Dean on the same project. But because that project involves rainbow fish, of course I'm going to ask Gary. <laughs> I'm going to ask Gary a couple things, right? I, I've got that lifeline. I'm going to use it when I can. So, number one lesson on how to master your aquarium. Never be afraid to ask questions. Now, if you don't... Maybe some, there's a lot of folks who live in, in areas where there's not a local club. We don't have, like, a really good local fish store. Like we just have, a you know, your big box stores where you might not have super expert aquarists working in the fish areas. Uh, and maybe, like, the people you think are going to give you the best information online are super hard to talk to, right? Like, uh, Corey from Aquarium Co-op. 
getting a- answering a random question from Corey is nigh impossible, <laughs> right? It's very hard. He's a super busy guy. He gets a jillion emails a day. It's impossible, right? He's got a he has to focus on certain things. That's why he has wonderful people like Candy who answer emails for the store, who also is a wonderfully knowledgeable person. So let's say you don't have that. Still ask questions. The difference is we're going to start using other resources to research. And, and let me explain. Like, Google is great. Most of my fish knowledge, initial, whenever I'm learning something to start, I never start by asking questions of people. I start by asking questions of the Internet. Right? And, and I work in tech. That's part of my thing, right? I'll use Google. I'll look up things. I'll find articles. And I'll read the same, like, here's the basics on X, article from like seven different people because I want to see where the common knowledge is and that's usually like this is the good stuff then I'll start looking at things like YouTube right I'll look stuff up on YouTube all the time and I'll want to watch like five or six videos on the same topic because there's little differences that each person is going to say and those tend to be like experience related or maybe they they've just they've had that one thing that uh, is different about their water and where they live that might apply. Things like this, right? I get all that information and I process it. And all those things that everybody says in common generally are the good advice, okay? Number two, so now we've asked questions. Never be afraid to ask questions. Never be afraid to research. Number two to mastering your aquarium, never be afraid to fail. You cannot be so paranoid about failure that when it happens it devastates you and let me explain fish are living creatures fish go through lots of stress plants even go through lots of stress and we can do everything perfect a little like dry spot in my throat sorry we can do everything perfect and we can still lose a fish during quarantine which, by the way, if you're not quarantining your fish, please quarantine your fish. Please, 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 please. Please, please, please. And, and man, literally, the chubby guppy, you're the best in chat. Literally, something is about to say. You can never master anything that you don't try. And you're never going to be perfect from the very start. I cannot tell you the number of times I have screwed up on all sorts of various things. Right? Uh, whether it's a plant, whether it's uh, some f- screwing up a fertilizer and having algae outbreaks, uh, whether it's pushing way too much light, whether it's pushing nowhere near enough light, uh, I've had I've lost fish because of all sorts of dumb mistakes. Uh, I, I've, I mean, you guys, a lot of you who've been around for a while, you've seen my video when I lost my zebra plecos, right? And that was 100% my fault, 100% my mistake. And you were talking catastrophic mistake because that's a adult colony of plecos, zebra plecos. They're all like three, three and a half years old, lost. Ugh, murder, right? Just crushed my heart. Still hurts to this day. But because that's happened, I'm not afraid to try again. We cannot be afraid of failure. We have to know that failure will occasionally occur. And what is important is that when we fail, we learn from that failure. We have to learn from the failure. As soon as we, because when we make a mistake, if we don't learn from it, we will repeat it. But if we learn from that mistake, we become a better aquarist like that. And despite the pain of losing fish, of losing a plant, uh, not sealing a tank correctly and having a tank reblow on you if you reseal a tank. Like, there's all sorts of things. If we let that one thing destroy us, we miss out on so much more. And the important part is missing out on where you can learn from falling down. There's that great quote in in Batman, right? You know, why do we fall? So we can pick ourselves back up. Learning from your failures becomes a lesson exactly omar and chat perfect right perfect once we learn from it it's no longer a failure it's a lesson there's also that uh the the, the thomas edison quote you know it's he didn't have a uh a, a thousand failures he had a thousand 
uh, you know, experiences or whatever the heck it is. I can't remember the exact quote because I'm bad at that one, but <laughs> those little things are important. Number three. You ready for this one? This one's tough. Never tell yourself you can't do it. Never tell yourself you can't do it. Let me explain, right? I feel like that one's a little self-evident, but I want to make sure we explain. There are a lot of people who will look at crazy high-end plants and go, I can't do that. Or they'll see an article that says, you can only keep this fish in this exact water co- in this exact water condition. And you'll go, well, I don't have that water condition. I live here and my water's like this. Right? Like, uh, you can only keep this this Corridora in soft water. Well, I live in the Midwest with liquid rock. I can't possibly keep that Corridora. And yet there are people in Pennsylvania who are some of the best Corridora breeders in the world where they have liquid rock out of the tap. Right? You've got that right there. Never tell yourself you can't. Just understand that before you do, make sure you've gone through steps one and two. We research, we don't be afraid to ask questions, and then two, we prepare ourselves and know that failure can and most likely will happen at some point. But learning from that failure is what matters. Then that whole never being afraid to try, easy, easy. I know, for you guys that have questions in chat, I will answer these very, very soon. I just want to get over my topic, and then, bam, we'll go to full q and I'll get everything. Don't worry. <laughs> Number four. This is the big one. Okay? Never, 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 when you're doing any form of research, whether it's before, after, or an, even just an opinion on something, never trust just one person. I hope that makes sense. But let me explain. Let us say you are you are trying to learn about plants and you watch this this crazy person Bentley on YouTube, right? He talks about plants pretty regularly. He's he's got all these accolades about plants. He's a he's a master something something something. Okay. But one source does not know everything. Like, I know quite a lot about fish. I had a 45-minute conversation with Gary Lang yesterday, and there was one thing that he said about my upcoming project, right, that I didn't even think about. And it was it's, the, it's a tiny little detail, very tiny little detail that I, I hadn't initially thought about. And the second he said it, it sunk into my brain, and it's not going anywhere. Would you like to know what that tip was? With rainbow fish, right? I normally buffer using crushed coral because my water is extremely soft. There's not very much in it. There's not very much carbonate hardness. And you need a little bit of carbonate hardness for rainbows. Okay? Well, I usually get my hardness up by using crushed coral. And, and that does the trick. But when you do water changes, because that water is so soft, it takes a while for that to remineralize itself. Gary has really similar water where he lives to what my water is here. It's ever so slightly harder out of the tap. But the difference is really minimal. His water is naturally very soft. My water is very soft. His advice was this, just use sodium bicarb instead. A little bit of baking soda goes an extremely long way. It's a significantly faster way to get your water to the same level of hardness as long as you do the, the math correctly, which you know, we're both, he, he's, he's a, he works in, um, he's a, like a Bio, biological chemist if I remember correctly and like I'm a I'm a tech engineer so we both know math right we're 
a lot easier and more importantly it's faster so you don't have swings in the water and even though like i've had pretty good success with rainbows i've had little things occur that i haven't that to me don't make sense right like this shouldn't have happened but that might be the answer so instantly that went in my head because i'm going to do this at a in a different fashion eventually like mass breeding or something like that the little fry are the are the most fragile so keeping them safe might be the difference right it might be that difference that matters the most last part for mastering your aquarium okay and it, the, again remember this is a little philosophical a little philosophical so we've got never be afraid to ask questions especially if you if you have a mentor great if you don't research online it's your best friend two be ready to fail and learn from it three never tell yourself that you can't do something always be willing to try four do i remember what my four last one was in the short version uh oh my brain just went out the window because i'm trying to think about the start oh yeah find multiple members don't don't trust one person don't trust just one person no matter what no matter how good they are listen to multiple people because they might and, and let me one of the most important reasons i live in seattle i have extremely soft water my advice can be really great for plants but if you have extremely hard water some of my advice might have to change in order to work for your water conditions and i typically talk from the perspective of my experience which is this really soft water right matter is really important number five this is the interesting one if somebody tells you something that you think is incorrect don't immediately dismiss it let me give you an example okay i have many times listened to newer aquarium keepers say some some level of generic advice that i either don't agree with or am kind of sitting there going like yeah that's not perfectly accurate but don't immediately dismiss it. Ask a question first. Because that advice could be experience based on something they've had happen that went wrong and they corrected that could maybe never ever happen for you. So like, let me give you an example the my guppies right i got them from a wonderful person named leanne who lives a couple hours north of me she lives on well water one of the things she told me is that she noticed her fish do better in slightly softer water than the really hard well water she has naturally so she started doing water changes with distilled water Now, instantly, my brain did this, right? Because I'm used to my extremely soft water. If I were to water change with distilled water, oh, we'd be asking for all sorts of problems, right? For her, though, what I was missing, and I, and I asked questions. I said, well, do you use any of your tap water? She's like, oh, well... I top off with distilled. If I'm doing a full water change, I, I mix it about 50-50. But the way that she had said it at first made it sound like only distilled water is going in this tank. And my brain is going, how are these fish alive? Right? There's not enough in distilled water for them to survive. <laughs> You'd have like bent spines, all sorts of nasty stuff going on. But instead of immediately going like, what are you doing? And going like aquarium police. I went tell me more right like i asked a question and i learned i learned something important 
she had through time and observation realized that her water was so hard compared to the water that those fish had been bred in that those fish actually struggled in her water to be continuously healthy and have the longer term lifespan that we expect out of those guppies that kind of like two to three years right she makes a change basically thinning down the hardness of her water by using distilled water so there's nothing in it so that it's diluting all of that and all of a sudden bam starts noticing much better breeding much better health better color everything and she's done that ever since when she had them because it makes sure that those fish get the conditions that have made her see success And that taught me a lesson because I, I asked her, I said, okay, well, have you checked how hard your water is out of the tap? Yeah, it's this. And then I did math in my head because that told me what I need to keep my tank at to help make sure that colony was as healthy as possible when I got the fish from her so that I could keep breeding them and get more and more of them and have this just horde of beautiful blue guppies swimming around in that big tank. Asking her a question immediately taught me what I needed to know to make that fish successful. And within months, right, that particular aquarium, that fish was mastered. Asked one question instead of immediately going, what are you doing? Why are you putting distilled water in a tank? Learn an important lesson, right? So that's it. Those are my lessons. Now, one final thing, okay? If you do have a mentor, some some wizened veteran that you can go to, I have found that the best way to learn from them, in my experience, is just sit and talk and enjoy those conversations because you'll absorb little tips you would have never thought to ask questions for just by talking about things. I can't tell you the number of like little tidbit type things I've learned from Master Breeder Dean just by us sitting and babbling about the fish we like, where we've had problems in the past, what it was like in the 80s versus the 90s, right? When like when I was growing up keeping fish and Dean was still a successful breeder at that point, like what the differences were, all these little things, little little stories about how we come to love fish and where we are in our fish life. Little, little jewels of knowledge just kind of just fall out of all those, like, wizened veterans. Just sit and listen. You'll learn. And you'll learn super important stuff. And you never would have thought it was that important. Until it's just this little, this little dash. A little dash of knowledge. And all of a sudden, the difference in what you will do as an aquarist... Instead of just kind of barely climbing, it'll lose little jumps, right? And those little jumps matter so much because that quality gives us that confidence, lets us do more things, lets us have more fun. It's pretty awesome. All right, so with that being said, that's how you master your aquarium. A little philosophical, I know. It's not like a direct, like, how do I learn how to do plants well? It's philosophical. But... I think if we take those lessons to heart, because I do it all the time, right? We can do a lot with it. So, with that being said, we'll go into questions and answers. Uh, very typical, do at Bentley Pasco. It makes it a lot easier for me to see questions. I'm going to scroll up to get a few of the ones I missed. Um, there's a few I know offhand that were there. And and I need to cover some some super chats and a new member. Thank you, you wonderful folks who did those uh, while I was sitting here babbling about crazy philosophical stuff. <laughs> Do, 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 do. Okay. So there's one from... <laughs> oh, man. Uh, so a little bit of Ghost Seahawks and some, some questions. We'll keep the football out just because I don't want to get nobody too angry, but sorry, Minnesota. <laughs> oh, wow. So uh, Richard Costa and I have been talking back and forth. So, so funny story. That weird, strange hair algae problem you helped me with. Not hair algae. It was Hydra infestation. Nuked the tank, and now it's looking great. 
that's funny because it looked a lot like kind of staghorn algae to me from the pictures, but they're just blurry enough that I, I guess I couldn't tell. <laughs> oh man, Hydra. I've had Hydra before and uh, it's, I mean, it's easy to get rid of, but it's annoying at first. Yeah, Lily isn't annoying. EJ Fishes. <laughs> Bentley is our mentor. Thanks, man. You're the best. <laughs> I try to I try to teach little lessons, but I know there are plenty of people that know a lot more. A lot more than me. More importantly, probably will have forgotten more than I will ever know. Master Breeder Dean and Gary Langer, those kind of people. <laughs> that's why I ask that's why I sit there and I just listen to it when they talk. <laughs> just like a little fly on the wall all the time. <laughs> Uh, da, 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 da. Master photographer, you you know, I want to just put this out there. Master photographer, I always appreciate every comment you leave because you are just such a gentleman. I just want to put that out there. You're you're absolutely fantastic. Uh, I appreciate your straightforward information and support of the hobby. Hey, man, got to love your hobby. Got to help people. DC Kyle, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. Wayne Gretzky, Michael Scott. <laughs> ah, for you office fans, you'll know that. For you sports fans. You'll know that better. <laughs> the fish tank barn being a member and Mike Kenseth with a super chat. Thanks, guys. Uh, you'll you actually, for those who are members, gonna have a little sneak peek coming. This is this Saturday. I think it's this Saturday. That'd be cool. You guys will like it. Six eight just with a, a generic super chat. I hope you have a question. If so, put it in chat, man. I'll get it for you. Uh, but thanks for the thanks for the super chat. And uh, okay, here we go. A couple of questions I saw. So first, Max Fish, what do you consider soft water? My 500 gallon rainbow fish tank. I am really jealous right now. Just put that. I had to stop for a second because I'm jealous. What do you suggest for a 24 inch deep water? Okay, so what do I consider soft water? Soft water is going to be anything that is typically not very hard. So if we're looking at like a GHKH, uh, like 2kh and less is pretty soft water when it comes to carbon hardness even like three degrees of kh you can also look at tds but tds isn't like the perfect way to determine hardness that just determines all the stuff in your water um but i would even say that anything under like 120 tds is pretty soft and then gh like four degrees of gh and lower is really soft water uh so the the water here in seattle if you want to go by tds the highest TDS I've ever seen out of my tap most summers is 32 TDS. There's nothing in my water. Uh, it comes out like, I think, 1 degree KH and 2 degrees GH. I mean, there's just nothing in it. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. Uh, so, you know, that can be good for a lot of people, but it, it takes uh, it takes some, some work to buffer it up long term. Uh, and then as far as 24-inch uh, deep water, Dwarf Sag, Amazon Swords, Madagascar Lace. So all those don't need super bright light. You can do something like just a Fluval 3.0 and be pretty fine. Although, granted, with a tank that big, you're probably going to need several of them. Um, one of the other things you can look into is you can try the, like, the floodlight approach if you want for something that's a little cheaper. I'm personally not a fan just because they're... They're cheap, but they're cheap for a reason. <laughs> That's the way I would put it. Um, it kind of depends on your budget. If you really want to go deep on that, like shoot me an email, maxfish. Uh, it's bentley.pasco at gmail.com. And give me the dimensions, the the like the the footprint of your tank. Cause we can we can play with some lights and do some stuff that can give you a lot of light um, for what you need. You don't need to have like a whole horde of light. Because most of that stuff doesn't require lots of light, but it's about getting the right type of light. And you can, there's certain lights out there that you can get a lot of light from that are super powerful but aren't very expensive. And you just lift them high off the tank and suspend them, and they spread their light pattern out and they work really, really well. So shoot me an email. We can talk about that and I can get you some better details without like taking like 15 minutes to explain it here <laughs> in the stream. Do, do, do. Catching up on chat. The Aquarium Guys! <laughs> this is my Kings fans, we forgive you. I will say this. It was, uh, I really hope that Dalvin Cook is okay because I, I just generically like that guy. And uh, I never want to see, like, a really good player get hurt because it, it's not fun. 
it, especially when it's like 50% of your offense or more. <laughs> ah. do, do, do. All right. I think I've caught up. Tiffany White, welcome. Welcome to Sue McGill. All right. So there was a question um, from about good places to buy rainbows. Uh, I think that was from Jason Howard, right? Right, right, right. So let's let me do that, and then I've got a few more I'm going to cover here that are more recent in chat. I just know that I saw that earlier. Uh, number one that I would say as far as online shippers, when Dan's Fish does his big rainbow orders, he's a really, really good source because of the particular person he's getting his rainbows from. Okay? Uh, number two... The Wet Spot Tropical Fish and Imperial Tropicals, which are two more consistent stores that regularly tend to have some stock of rainbow fish, both carry pretty good rainbow fish from a very good set of farms and or bloodlines, depending on what you want to pick here. Both of them have access to fish that originated from Gary Lang at one point in certain species. So that's nice, right? Because that gives you a good high quality strain. Uh, finally, after that, Aquabit is a really good source for very nice rainbows. You just have to know the right sellers. If you really want to know that seller list, shoot me an email, bentley.pasco at gmail.com. I will tell you the screen names of all the good sellers to look for. Uh, and finally, like, there's a really good Facebook group called Rainbow Fish Live. Uh, there's a few other Rainbow Fish groups, but that's just the one that I tend to pay the most attention to. There's a couple of sources in there where they talk about some of the best people to buy Rainbow Fish from as far as both retailers and all that kind of stuff, but it's, it's a good place to start. Also, it's a really good place to get some advice and just see really cool pictures of pretty, pretty rainbows. It's what I spend most of my time doing. <laughs> all right. So Stephen P. Apparently I got my CO2 at green drop checker color with four bubbles per second in my 40 breeder. When should I consider upping the lights and furts? Uh, so I would say so green basically gets you between 30 and 35 parts per million CO2 in the water, which is like the, the target range. I would immediately begin upping your lights. Uh, you don't need to go all the way to full blast. You could do like step it up halfway between where you are now and full blast for a week and then step it up again after a week, week and a half. Um, and then again with your furts, if you can just do daily fertilizing, it, that's going to be the absolute best and just try to target depending on what fertilizer you're using. So like if you're using easy green, for example, I would literally do in a 40 breeder. I do my, I got to do math in my head. Sorry. That's, that's why you, you're, you'll start smelling smoke through the, through the internet there. Normally it would say I do eight shots in a week total. I would alternate doing one pump and two pump every other day just and then test and find yourself once you get to that like 10 to 20 nitrates range you're doing good but if you can get into that um don't push too far above that right we just want to keep it a consistent level and one pump per day might be all you need it depends on the particular plant load but if you have super super fast growing plants like rotales and stuff like that you want more if you have a little bit slower growing plants, like more crips and some of the Ludwigias and some of the stuff that doesn't grow quite as fast, then you can dial it back and only need like one pump a day. So it just depends on your plant load and, and what you're trying to accomplish there. All right, JT Zamora. How do you overcome the fear of shipping fish? Fear for the fish, of course. <laughs> uh, as someone who's only shipped fish like twice... Well, no, that's not true. I've shipped fish four times now. Is that right? Four? Five? Five times. Five times. Um, I mean, the the big thing is just watch, watch the videos of the people who ship really well and see what they're doing. And look at any, any fish that you've brought in. Look at the ones that have done the best. Now, me personally... I don't have the setup to do what Dan's fish does where it's like individually packaged fish and they all have individual air. I use breather bags, but what I try to do is put the minimal number of fish in each bag that I can, because that way, if something goes wrong in one bag, it doesn't spoil a bunch of fish. It only spoils 
you know, maybe one or two fish. And if they're very, very small, maybe it's three fish, right? I'm trying to minimize that impact. Um, two, like, make sure that you have the right materials. Just, you know, like, whether it's from, like, uh, AQ PKG, which is Aqua Package, um, which is who I use for like the my eye itches. I'm sorry, <laughs> uh, the like styrofoam liners and stuff that fit the USPS uh, priority flat rate boxes, and, and like getting like heat packs and stuff like that. Like just find a good supplier to get you all the things you need, and then honestly, it's just careful packing, right? Try to make sure that you're not like putting hard or potentially sharp things like bits of cardboard in there. Make sure that you've got lots of cushion around the bags that you have. If you're just doing breather bags, like I do, like I wrap my breather bags in paper towels and I set them very carefully side by side. So they basically are cushioning each other against the styrofoam walls. And then if I have extra space, I tend to keep those little like air packets from uh, or, or spare bubble wrap when I try to keep a small supply of that from like any Amazon stuff so that I can put that in there as a buffer. Right. And, and then just knowing that there is some level of error you can never account for the USPS, UPS, FedEx, whichever one it is. However, do everything you can in the first place and you just kind of have to fire it off with trust. And eventually you'll find that like most of those places, as long as they, the box is labeled and they know it's live fish and you're adhering to all their requirements, they actually do a really good job of delivering live fish. They, they really do. Um, but you kind of, those first couple shipments, you're going to, you're going to be paranoid. You're going to be paranoid. I, I was, and I think I lost like one fish out of about a hundred and like, 20 I shipped so pretty good right pretty lucky but it you just kind of got to get to that point you got to be willing to to let it happen Brian and one of the other the rainbow fish Brian's of another hobby I've been 15 plus years I feel about every two years my knowledge skill leveled up do you feel it can be similar in this hobby three years in still very newbish yeah no definitely so and part of that is like you learn more about things you might not keep, but that impacts the things you do keep. So let me give you an example. I'm not very good with shrimp, right? I've tried shrimp several times. I've had lots of failures. And I think part of that is just like, if I'm going to do shrimp, I need to make some small adjustments and keep them in a much larger tank than a 10 gallon, which is usually when I've tried shrimp or I've tried shrimp with fish. And those particular fish have gone like hog wild on the, the, <laughs> the babies so they they were they weren't able to increase their colony number and eventually they just die out so this saturday is it this saturday or is it next saturday i think it's this saturday yeah this saturday i am actually going out to a shrimp reader and i'm i'm doing an interview with him and a tour because he just set up a brand new fish room and it's it's gorgeous and he's he's had a website for a few years and he's been doing this for a while he's He's actually got his own strain that he's been working on and perfecting over the last, I think he said five years, um, that he's gotten it to the pattern he wants and he's been perfecting it. He's been working on it longer than that, if I remember correctly from our short conversation. Um, so I'm, I'm going to him because I'm, while I might be good with plants and I'm good with rainbow fish, I'm terrible at shrimp. I really am. And I like shrimp a lot. I kind of want to have like a shrimp tank or a species of shrimp that does well for me. <laughs> So I'm going out there, one, because I want to get that information out to you folks. Two, because I want to learn myself, right? And I, I know that if I learn that little extra bit about shrimp, it will impact something else in my hobby. Because shrimp live in an environment that's kind of close to rainbow fish to begin with. A little bit of minerals in the water. Tends to be in areas where there's some good flow, some good oxygen. They like, they, they appreciate certain things. There's some differences like how we keep shrimp versus how we keep rainbow fish, right? We're typically not doing like huge water changes because we're trying to keep the the shrimp's mineral content in their water like really stable with additives and stuff like that. But they live in like streams where there's constant water changes, right, in the wild. So there's some part of that that all like is very similar to rainbows. And a lot, they come from similar parts of the world. 
<laughs> where the water is kind of similar. So there's there's something that can be learned from a master shrimp breeder that can impact me not only trying to have better success with shrimp, but having success with all of my tanks. So like that's something I'm really looking forward to. Um, plus, you know, his shrimp room, his shrimp room is gorgeous. Like I've seen a couple pictures and it's just like one of the cleanest things I've ever seen. Like, you know how clean master breeder Dean's fish room is. This is similarly clean or at least his pictures were. So I hope it's that clean when I go there and film, but it's, it's an opportunity to sit down and have another interview. Kind of like what I did with Jason from redfish, bluefish in a sense of, um, learning from someone that has a completely different aspect to the hobby than I do. And I've done the same thing with like folks that do saltwater and it, Every, every time I do that, I kind of I kind of glean some little lesson. So I think, yeah, every two to three years, you're probably going to have, like, a, you could probably look back and go, like, man, I know I'm so much better at X than I was a couple of years ago. I've learned so much since that point that it's looking back at, what was I doing two years ago? I can't believe I was doing that compared to now, right? You're, you're going to learn. You're going to make those leaps. Just, I think the longer anybody stays in any hobby, especially something that's kind of, like, biological and sciencey you're gonna have those big jumps over time and i think every couple of years is probably good to see like relatively large leaps in your knowledge base jack nice simple name what is the dosage of epsom salt to treat constipated angelfish i'll be honest i actually don't know um i, I would say google <laughs> <laughs> will help you better than I can. And and the only reason why I say that is I've... So part of the way that I prevent constipation in fish, so this might be why this will help you a little bit, uh, I always have a fasting day. So I will feed six days of the week, and typically Sundays, although sometimes that shifts. It depends on um, how my work schedule has been. There will be one day where I don't feed my fish at all. And that helps them process everything, helps prevent constipation issues. Also, like, I mix in a good amount of food so that there's some kind of vegetable matter to help push things through. Um, like, my fish regularly get a spirulina flake. And my Leopoldi angels very recently have been eating uh, blanched zucchini that I've put in for a species of pleco I keep. Which has been kind of interesting watching them eat that when I didn't expect them to. There was a question earlier, and hopefully that person's still in chat. I remember this now from the very start, of how to get angelfish to spawn. We're going way back, and now I'm, I'm remembering it instead of chat. So um, let me tell you how I got my angelfish to spawn by accident, which is to say this is probably not the best answer. There's a really good video about um, breeding angelfish from Master Breeder Dean on the Aquarium Co-op channel, which I think is really worth watching. Because that guy is a, a true master of angels. And he loves angelfish. Good water changes help. Right? They All fish really love fresh water. But the big thing is having lots of plentiful micro foods. So when I feed my angelfish, about every three days to four days, I give frozen food if I'm not hatching live brine. If I'm hatching live brine, every time I feed live brine, they get some too. And part of the reason for that is, one, it's just a much better food than any of your prepared flakes or granules or, or pellets, any of that stuff, right? It's just a better food for them. But two, having plentiful amounts of food, especially very small food, triggers something in the fish's instinct to know, like, there's lots of stuff around for baby fish to eat. So it's okay to spawn right now because there will be enough food for the babies and they will survive. That helps a lot. Temperature can help a lot too. Sometimes your tank can be too hot. Sometimes it's too cold to where they're not going, they can survive, but they're not going to breed. So try and find that optimal temperature range, uh, which for me right now, my angelfish tank is sitting about 76 degrees. I actually brought the tank temperature down because I was concerned it was running it too warm. Uh, it was sitting about 80, 81, depending on how warm the, the day was. Uh, I brought it down a lot. I just cranked the heater that is in there down uh, and relied more on the ambient temperature of the room. 
uh, and the final thing, recently I've been putting zucchini in that tank. They've been eating it like a ton. And coincidentally, and I mentioned this to Master Breeder Dean when I saw my angelfish eggs, um, what, a week after they started getting fresh zucchini, I saw the very first spawn I've ever seen out of those fish. So don't be afraid to try something different, like some vegetables or something. You never know what might, what new food might trigger your fish. You just never know what might make them go, this is the stuff, and there's plenty of it around for babies. Let's do this thing. So I hope if you either watch the replay or you're still here, that that helps. <laughs> Whoa, chat's jumping on me. I'm trying, I'm trying to catch up, I promise. I know. I take too long to answer questions. I've got that problem. I'm, I'm too... Uh, I'm too verbose. Uh, Rico Stan, is Aquahuna good for rainbows too? You know, I'm not sure. I haven't tried rainbows from Aquahuna. In general, though, just knowing um, who Aquahuna is, they tend to have really good supply... I'm just not sure about their rainbows. And and that's just a matter of, I don't know the bigger distributors, which in the end, Aquahuna is the direct version of a distributor, as well as I know like some of the stores that happen to sell online that are really good or are tied to farms. Uh, Blake is, I'm from upstate New York. Is it a bad idea ordering fish during cold weather? So you don't want to do it when it's too cold, but like if it's right now where it's in the fifties or sixties in Seattle, if you're in that kind of weather, or even the forties, that can be okay because they'll just put heat packs in there. Just make sure that whoever it is, is doing heat packs. It's actually easier to ship in cooler weather than it is to ship in hot weather. Um, but that being said, if you start getting way too cold, we start getting like 20 degrees overnight and stuff like that. That's where it starts becoming risky and some places know how to do it very well. But if you're not know you're going to be there the second it shows up and you don't you don't know like they're, they're, you're a fast route and all this kind of stuff or it's overnight express. It's where it starts getting a little risky at that point. Million and Sons. I had a super red mini Ludwigia leaned over and now individual stems with leaves are growing where the leaves were upright. Could this be a method used for propagation? All growing tall. Uh, yes. So I actually have a video about letting uh, certain species of plants, uh, in particular the one I showed is Ludwigia pantanal, where you let them lay across the water surface and they'll shoot child stems off the side because they're getting so much light at that point that the extra stems can get lots and lots of light and all the things they need to photosynthesize. So it's a, it's kind of a cool way to cheat. It's really easy to do with Ludwigias and Rotalas. That's the most like common species of plants that do that really, really effectively. And you can, instead of getting like one or two kind of side shoots, you can get 10, 12, right? Really, really fast. And it's, it's a really nice. And you really only have to let them get about yay long, like about three inches or so before you can break them off and plant them. And propagate, or if you're trying to sell them, you, you'll want to, like, break them off, propagate them like you would plant them, and then let them get a little bit taller and grow some roots, and then you can pull them out and sell them off. But yes, very, very effective for certain species of plants. Oh, Richard Costa, been breaking up the doses like you recommended. I have fast growers and super slow growers, like Boost, Crinum. Is it even possible to keep them all happy? Yeah, you just... Um, the slow growers don't have a huge nutrient uptake, and in the case of the crinum, just make sure that there's like a root tab for the crinum. Uh, the boost will be fine. Boost has a really, really minimal requirement. It's just making sure that those really fast growers are doing okay, and they don't hog so much nitrates that there's nothing in the water. So if you can keep, if you run a, a test like an API kit or something like that, and always see like 10 to 20 ppm of nitrates in your water, you're perfect. Everything will be happy as far as nutrient requirements are concerned uh, at, your, at your macro level. Micros might get different, but in theory, the micros are used in such a limited amount that if your macros are right, your micros are right. Rockford Fish Keeping. Hey, good to see you. Have you tried a mono shrimp? <laughs> well, let me tell you about a mono shrimp. 
I like a mono shrimp a lot because they're very effective cleaners. I, I even like the fact that um, they they have like millions of eggs and the females get huge, but they can't like properly raise them in fresh water. The problem is big rainbow fish will tear a mono shrimp apart. And I learned this the hard way by losing like 35 full size adult mono shrimp. I bought them at full size on purpose because I was like, oh, the big ones, the, the rainbows will leave those alone. They have small mouths. No, they'll tear them apart until they can eat them. Because they're jerks. <laughs> so uh, I started noticing, like, all my mono shrimp kind of huddled in one area where it was hard for the rainbows to get. And then slowly but surely, they just started getting picked off because, like, the smaller of the rainbows would flush them out. And the bigger rainbows would pick them apart. They literally, like, team tactics this stuff. Because they're jerks. And they just saw food and, like, rainbows have bottomless stomachs. So one, one of the reasons why I don't have shrimp very often is because rainbows just murder them. <laughs> uh, I'm assuming that's an I do, but what do you think about probiotics for freshwater fish, like Dr. Tim's Echo Balance? Okay. So here's... You might take this as a controversial statement, but... There are some places that have taken some changes in their food on purpose to make their food have less added vitamins and probiotics and, and X and Y and Z and chemical stuff, right? This stuff doesn't exist in nature. If we can maintain good water quality, give our fish a healthy diet... And, and do the right maintenance, we should never need probiotics. If we're quarantining new fish appropriately, making sure that we're not bringing in sick fish into our tanks, we should never need probiotics. Now, Dr. Tim knows a whole lot more than me. The man's a doctor, <laughs> specifically in the aquatics field, right? He knows a lot. He's going to build a product with a purpose. My personal philosophy is I don't want to add too much that isn't like... Now, if there's nutrients you need to add... And not nutrients, but like mineral content you need to add to your water to better keep that fish. So like my water is extremely soft. I need to add minerals to it for things like shrimp and rainbow fish because they need that certain amount of mineral in their water to be happy. That's fine. But once we start talking like vitamins and probiotics, I get a little more leery. Now, certain vitamins, if it's just like your uh, natural vitamin complex that can't exist in the water anyway, whatever. That's fine. But I don't want to dose effectively medicines at my fish continuously. Because we don't know what adding those, like probiotics that are outside are going to do long term i don't think we have enough studies on that and if we do then i want to read them because i haven't yet but i would trust dr tim know a lot more about that than me as far as the science behind it it's just kind of personal policy all right all right, all right. i'm gonna try and catch up the chat here uh joanna the info has changed throughout the years yeah, yeah. So that's a, that's an interesting thing to talk about. Like one kind of note about uh, the things that we know about fish has changed over time. So sometimes learning like the lessons from the old wizened masters really matters. But at the same time, sometimes that information can be outdated with some of the stuff we do today or some of the fish that we use now. So it's kind of like a, you got to play a healthy balance, but a lot of times it's like those old wise and masters have these little tips and tricks here and there that just apply endlessly throughout time, right? Fish, if they could keep fish with less stuff than we have now, then clearly some of those things are important, right? If they could have fish be healthy, successful, and breed 30 years ago, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, my great-grandmother in, like, the 50s and 60s <laughs> breeding scolari angelfish. If those things worked back then, 
it probably worked now, right? It'd probably worked now, even though we've got tech has changed and all that kind of stuff. Probably good. Uh, Brian, any feedback on aquatic arts? I know several YouTubers who say lots of lots of nice things about aquatic arts. Um, I've had some folks say that sometimes things come in really well, sometimes things come in not so well. All that matters is that is their customer service good, and for the most part, what I've heard is yes. I personally have never ordered from Aquatic Arts, and I'm, a lot of that is just comes down to I'm a rainbow fish nerd. I'm a, to the point of where I'm a rainbow fish nerd with a uh, refined taste, which is to say I'm a picky rainbow fish nerd, and I want really specific stuff. So it's hard for me to find that in a lot of places. Um, that being said, they have some cool stuff that I've looked at and went like, eh, that might be cool one day. But I that gets instantly sidetracked because I'll, I'll see the next shiny rainbow or, or some other thing that I want to do instead. <laughs> and I'll go in that direction. Uh, so me personally, I've never used them, but I've heard mostly good feedback about aquatic arts. I can't say I've heard too much negative. So I would think reasonably good company. They do advertise a decent amount through lots of smaller YouTubers, which is nice. They support smaller YouTubers. Which is pretty cool in my book. Do, 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 do. A fly running around my house. It's going to be like the vice presidential debate. JT Zamora, do you have any experience with Ricky Affluitans? <laughs> Do I have experience with Ricky at Fluid Zans? This is probably going to be the last question unless we get one more short one. So, some say it's a mess, but I've seen where it stays in a ball. What makes the difference for people? Um, I have experience with Ricky at Fluid Zans. It has completely taken over part of my plants for profit tank. And so much so to where I basically need to rip almost every single plant out of that tank in order to get rid of it. If it gets up and floating, it's like bladder wart, duckweed, and all those like horrifically pain in the butt to get rid of plants. It's very, very, very hard to get rid of. That being said, it hates flow. Rick, the enemy of Ricky of Fluitans is flow. Now, if you can keep it controlled in a spot and let it like form little bushes, it's really pretty. It's very easy to grow. It doesn't need CO2. But, but <laughs> it can get out of hand really, really fast. So take that with what you will. It's like moss on super steroids when it comes to how fast it'll grow and take over things, where moss is much more controllable. <laughs> Hey, Dr. Black in chat. You going to be uh, going live here shortly, Doctor? Got to know, because if so, you're you're the guy after me. We're talking about some, uh, also some ammonia, which is a, a live food that's pretty easy to culture. Chat's interesting tonight. I want to make sure I don't miss anything here. Uh, oh, Blake, let me answer that. So is there a test kit that has all the tools I need to test my water parameters? Right now I have the API test kit. The only thing the API doesn't include with their master test kit is GH and KH. If you go by, they have a GH and KH test. You basically are testing everything you need to know for fresh water. Until you start getting into like really crazy levels of certain things, then there's some, some other stuff. Okay, so well, that being said, we got Dr. Black coming up very, very shortly. Thank you so much for all of you guys that have been here chattering. We've got uh, roughly 130 people in chat right now. It's pretty dope. That's, I think, more viewers than I think I've ever had. So, thanks. <laughs> um, and just a kind of final final lesson, if you missed the front half, like, watch it. It's only about 20 minutes where I talk about uh, things that are coming up. But, yeah. So, got a couple things. We'll have uh, going back to Redfish Bluefish. Here very very soon i'm dropping off a bunch of guppies with him they'll go for sale in the near future not right away at this first time they're still growing out he will have a very very cool uh species of ancestress pleco also coming from me which 
I'm just gonna I'm just gonna do this. I'm not gonna show you a picture. I'm just gonna give you something to look up. Just this one word. It's German. So that's an ancestress. Wabenmooster. Look that bad boy up if you haven't seen it before. It's nice. It's real nice. But I got a bunch of babies that are growing up that uh, have been a, a secret thing I haven't told anybody about. It's like I keep secrets or something. Uh, once they get to the right size for shipping, those will go out to either him or Bob Steen. One of the two. Kind of depends. We're gonna we're gonna see how some conversations go. And then uh, that'll be some other stuff where I'll help some local businesses sell some cool fish that I've been breeding. As always, guys, thank you so much. Fish from Fever right at the end. Thanks, buddy, for the sticker. <laughs> thank you so much for watching, guys. I hope that you've had a blast. Stay awesome. Yeah.